You can be seated if you can this morning. Thank you, worship team, for your hard work and beautiful singing. Children's Church, you're dismissed. Amen. Give them a hand. Hallelujah. There's a lot more that goes into worship than just showing up and picking up a guitar or a microphone or drums and begin to play. Amen. There's thought into it. There's practice into it. There's a lot, lot of working parts. There's those that are back there in the booth that's doing all their work and making sure everything sounds right. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. They, they need to know how thankful we are. Amen. Well, as they're finding their places, you can begin by getting your Bibles ready. We're going to be in 1 John chapter 1 this morning as we continue in the sermon series, Identity Crisis. Um, But, you know, as I was preparing for this and thinking about uh, what we're going to talk about this morning, uh, we're going to look at the first four verses in, in 1 John chapter 1. And, you know, one of the most important parts of all of humanity whether, whether Christian or non-Christian, all of humanity, one of the most important parts of life is relationship. Amen? Relationship. Uh, we are social creatures. Amen? We are social creatures and we desire relationship. You know, uh, um, th- this, this need for, for uh, relationship is apparent in us as children. Uh, uh, and it's established in us through the family structure, the way God created it. Amen. It, it's developed throughout our lives by our parents, by our relatives, uh, 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 friendships as we grow older, and then as we find a spouse one day and then have children one day, and the circle begins to go over and over and over of life in relationship. Amen. There's a handful of people in the world that are recluses that like to be alone. Uh, but most people do not want to be alone. Most people need relationship. We need each other. Amen? And these relationships, they influence our lives. If you think about your life now and you think back on those that have been a part of your life, you will think about relationships you've had with loved ones and friends and so on that have greatly influenced who you are today. Amen? Relationships are important. They, they, they either build up or they tear down our character. They either build our character or tear down our character. It can go either way. But they greatly affect our lives from the beginning to the end of our life. Now, there are a few characteristics about relationships I want to mention this morning before we get into the text. And one is this, is that you cannot have a relationship with someone you do not know. It's impossible. You cannot have a relationship with someone you do not know. And you, you, you cannot know someone that you've never met. Now, we live in a different world today because we can virtually or digitally know someone. We can contact someone. We can communicate with someone. We can use FaceTime or some sort of face-to-face contact digitally. And we can have a relationship with someone across the world. We're having to learn to do that with our daughter. And it's a little bit difficult, but it's, it's great compared to what it could be. Amen? It's great compared to what it could be. So you can have a relationship with someone remotely in our world today. But you take the virtual and the digital factor out of it. If you've never met that person, you cannot come to know that person because you can't spend time with that person. Amen? For example... Uh, m- most of us know of the tragic events that happened yesterday when former President Trump was uh, an assassination attempt was, was tried on him, and unfortunately others were hurt as, as well as himself. But many in our nation yesterday, including possibly some of you that are here today, were moved at that moment. There was a spark of emotion, you know, as, as a former president, someone running for president now, someone we see on the news all the time, someone we feel a connection with, but we don't know them. Someone we feel a connection with was, was just harmed. You know, we have somebody on TV often, we almost feel like we have a relationship with those people. 
And so many of you uh, was probably moved emotionally. You know, I've heard stories about when President Kennedy was shot and people seen it on TV and, and that the whole nation was just distraught and people cried and they never even met the man, didn't even know the man personally, but they cried and they was moved emotionally. And sometimes we're like that because we care for their well-being even though we don't know them. But you may have been moved emotionally and you may feel as though you know him, but you do not have a relationship with the former president. To my knowledge, if you do, you're keeping a secret. But you can't have a relationship with him because you've never really met him. You're not in his circle of people that he has a relationship with. So you don't know him that well, even though it moves us when things like that happens. John... In, in this first chapter, he, 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 is, he is, when he writes this epistle, he understands true relationship. And I'm saying all that to get to the main point here. John understands relationship, and John understands having a relationship with Jesus. Remember, he is the disciple, by his own confession, the disciple that Jesus loved. Amen? The disciple that Jesus loved. When they're sitting at the Last Supper, John leans over on Jesus. John loved Jesus and Jesus loved John, just like he did the rest of them. But John understood in a different way what that relationship part meant. He understood it in a much deeper way. So John wants you and I to know that we can also have a relationship with Jesus. Amen? That's what he's trying to teach in, in this epistle, in this letter, is that we can also have a relationship with Jesus. And so he begins this, his letter explaining that uh, to people who were, uh, who were increasingly being misled by false teaching about who Jesus is. And so John presents that Jesus is more than a mystical being. He's more than a philosophical thought. He's more than, than simply a divine being or a deity that is far beyond our reach of knowing personally. No, Jesus is God, and that's how John presents him. He is God who became like one of us, who became like one of us so that he could make himself known and he could restore what was originally created in the garden, and that is a creation able to have a relationship with the Creator. That's what John wants to show us in this. We're calling this series Identity Crisis. Listen, we can't know our identity in Christ if we don't first know Him and know who He is. So let's look at this this morning in 1 John chapter 1. In 1 John chapter 1 verse 1, if you'll stand with me for the reading of God's Word this morning. Hold your Bibles in there and repeat after me. I believe this is the Word of God. I believe it's the absolute truth. I believe it's inspired of the Holy Ghost. And I believe I can pattern my life after. Amen. In verse 1, it says, that, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. Everybody say word of life. The life appeared. we seen it and testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you that we have seen and heard so that, uh, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. Father, I thank you for your word. And God, I pray that you help me to preach this in a way that's real and real simple. Lord God, that it, that, it, that it encourages us, that it builds us up. Lord, that it convicts us. Lord, that it helps us to move forward in our relationship with you. Lord, help us to know you better. Lord God, every week as we go on, every day as we get into your word, every day as we seek you in prayer and we commune with you in prayer. Lord God, help us to grow to grow closer to you in a relationship with you, Lord God. Help us to understand, Jesus, Lord, that, that you're not just some, some, some mystical imagination, but that you are real, you are approachable, that, that you love us, that you gave your life for us, and that you want to have a relationship with us. You want to know us. You want us to know you. 
And Lord, I pray that you help us to grow in that way. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. So John, in, in, in this, in this, this is really the introduction to 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. But, but John, is, he's laying a foundation by which he's going to make his points in this epistle. Uh, and, and some of these points are the purposes for which he writes this epistle. We, we've, we've looked at probably one of these so far, and we may readdress it before we're done. But, but, but I want to show you these. In, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 4, it says what we just read, to make our joy complete. That's one purpose for this epistle. Secondly, in, 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 in 2 First uh, John uh, chapter 2, verse 1, he tells us that he writes to warn us of habitual sin, or so that we may not sin. We know that that is talking about habitual sin or a lifestyle of sin. We talked about that last few weeks. And, and then uh, number 3 is in verse 26 of chapter 2. Uh, it's to refute false teaching. We'll touch on that today. We won't get all the way into that. And then in chapter 5, verse 13, is where he really draws to the conclusion. And it's to assure us of our salvation. That is the purposes of John writing this epistle. It's to touch on those points so that we will know Christ better. Amen? So we will know who we are in him. Amen? So John is writing at a time when false teaching is on the rise. I mean, it's, re it's really coming up through the ranks. False teaching is everywhere. And, and, and many Christians are beginning to fall into this false teaching. Now, John wrote this letter, just for the understanding of history, in, in approximately 80 to 90 A.D. So John, John's an old man when he writes this, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But at this point in time, when John writes this epistle, the church had been established the church had grown great in number. You know, even, even after the day of Pentecost, the church was growing by thousands. And then when the church began to experience persecution because the church faced great persecution, and because of that, the church was scattered abroad and it began to grow even more. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Colin shared something at men's ministry the other day, and I, I will probably play this at some point uh, in, a, in a few in sometime in, the, in a future sermon. But it's talking about the persecution of the church in China because they can't meet like we do. Amen? They can't come together and have a fellowship or a Bible study like we do. They have to meet in homes and keep it quiet and, and hide things. And they can't, they can't go packing around a big old Bible like this. And in and, and, and this thing that Colin shared with us, that, that they, they have it memorized. And they memorize it quickly in case it's taken away from them. Because they can't be seen with it because it's illegal to have the word of God on you. And yet there are more people that, that, that meet together in fellowship to worship God on, on, a, on any given Sunday in China than there are in all of the United States and Canada. That's amazing. But if it's raining too hard, we don't go to church. If we got you know, some little thing going on, a cough or whatever, we just don't show up to church. But they do. And they risk their life every single time to show up and to learn the word of God. That is written on their heart because they don't always have it here. And many times we won't even bring a Bible. Do you see the comparison? That's what persecution does to the body of Christ. It creates a desire for more. Not more persecution, but more of him. Amen. And when the church was persecuted, they scattered abroad. And therefore, they was in all different uh, nations and they was in all over the place in, 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 in that area. And they become a multicultural church. Now, let me just say, being multicultural is good. There's a lot of churches outside of this local community that are multicultural. You have people from, that, that, that are from all over the world coming to the same church. Now, this was the issue that, that happened with the early church is because sometimes multicultural uh, 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 churches or multicultural gatherings of believers sometimes creates a hurdle that you have to overcome. 
It's nothing bad. You just have to overcome it. And with the early church, it was a hurdle that was causing some issues at the time. And because with this vast cultural influence, the church, uh, the church there also came. Uh, there also came in in that in that multicultural influences. There came uh, 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 um, opinions. You know how many knows people have opinions, right? We have trouble with opinions in, in the church today, not just in this. I'm talking about in the church, amen? Uh, th- there came uh, opinions from people that considered themselves to be intellectuals or to be extremely intelligent. Remember, much of this went into uh, uh, Greece and, 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 in, and in some of those areas, amen? And, and so uh, peop- the Greek people are known for being very intellectual, very intelligent, and so some of this stuff began to come in. And, you know, God warned the people of Israel. If you remember, when, when they come out of Egypt and they was going their, their 11-day march, which took 40 years, into the promised land of Canaan, the land that God gave them, which is modern-day Israel, not quite, they got a little piece of the promised land right now. They're supposed to have a whole lot more. But anyway, that's a whole other thing. But, but as they was going there, God warned them to be careful of the influences they would encounter. To be careful of these other cultures, these other religions, because they would influence them and turn them against God or twist what God had already told them to where they believed something else. I mean, knows if you read through the Old Testament, Israel struggled with that greatly. Well, the New Testament church that we're reading about now struggled with it even then because of the influences that was coming into the church. And because of other nationalities, other religions, and things like that that was influencing other people, those who are unlearned. But also in the church today, we have to be careful. Amen? We have to be careful with the things that we allow to influence us. Because if we, are, if we don't get ourselves grounded in the Word of God, if we're, not, if we're not involved in church and hearing the Word of God, then we can be pulled astray by things that sound similar to the Word of God. Amen? It's, it happens very easily. Uh, uh, th- those outside influences can open the door of doubt, open the door of unbelief, of false doctrines from, from other religious beliefs. You know, the enemy of our soul, his name's the devil, by the way, Satan, the enemy of your soul wants to create confusion. He wants to create uh, 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 false truths, deception. He is the master of false truths. Amen? He is a master at deception. He's good at it. He's been doing it since the garden. Amen? He's very good at what he does. And, and sometimes those of us who, 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 who are uh, unaware will get pulled away. Amen? We'll get pulled away. Uh, so John, he, he addressed uh, much of this false teaching at the time right from the start. You may say, well, it really didn't sound like it in those first four verses. But when you really look at what John's saying... He is speaking straight to the false teaching that the believers in Christ are hearing. And he's speaking straight to it. And I want to show you that this morning. And this will also apply today with the, the cultural uh, 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 um, religious influences, the, the, the false teaching, the false religions that are in the world today. And I, I don't have time to get into all that. that. That may even be for the next sermon. You know, I could list all the occultic groups and religions and sororities and all of those things, but... We, We'll save that if we get to it next week. But Solomon said this, and I love this, in Ecclesiastes 1 verse 9. In the last part of that, he says, There is nothing new under the sun. Nothing new under the sun. And, and, I, and I bring this up because the devil hasn't gained new material. Amen? He hasn't gained new material. The lies of the devil in John's day, when John is teaching this, this, uh, this epistle, and he's writing this, the lies of the devil are the same lies the devil has been telling since the garden. The very same lies. He just paints them with a different brush. He doesn't have new material. He just has new listeners. Amen? And we fall into the trap many times. The devil don't have anything new. He's using the same old schemes in a different way. Amen? The same old schemes in a different way. Even in our world today, there are those who teach things that are uh, not the truth. And we have to be careful. Amen? So, John started this epistle in, in these first four verses in an introduction. From the beginning, 
from the beginning, just as he did in the gospel account of John, and just as he did, uh, or just as he did in the gospel account of John, referring to Genesis one one, which is in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Right now, turn with me, if you will, over to John chapter one. Not first John chapter one. We're already there. Go back to the gospel of John, chapter one, beginning in verse one. If you haven't memorized any scripture, memorize this. Memorize these first five verses and get it in you. Get it in your heart to where you can recite it no matter what. Amen? Get it in you. In the beginning, it says, was the Word. And the Word was with God. Who is the Word? I can't hear you. You still ain't loud enough. Who is the Word? Okay, y'all going to have to work on that and say it with some excitement. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through Him all things were made, and with, without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So John makes a declaration there about who Jesus is, Amen. So when John begins over here, go back to 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. When John begins here, that which was from the beginning, he is referencing what he said in the beginning of his gospel account, and he's referencing what happened in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth. John is saying there that, that he's establishing that Jesus has always been, that he is eternal. Amen. He is eternal. He was from the beginning. He was before the beginning and he still is today. Amen. He is the source and the basis of all existence. He is the creator of all things, of all life and the entire universe. That's who Jesus is. He's establishing that in the very first few words of this, of this epistle. He establishes Jesus' deity, his omniscience, which means he knows everything. And his omnipotence, which means he is all-powerful. Amen? And then, John also establishes that Jesus was real. Amen? That he was and that he is real. Jesus existed not only in spirit, but in flesh. Uh, in, in, in the first two verses there, and you may not see it, but just bear with me. I'm going to try to show it to you. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it, and testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. Now, does not that not, when you read that and, and, and really listen, does it not sound a lot like the beginning of the Gospel of John? Jesus always has been. And he appeared, and he made himself real. Amen? John is saying, listen, we heard him, we saw him, and we touched him. He is real. Amen? He is real. The one who is eternal is more than spirit. The one that John is writing about, Jesus, he is eternal, and he's more than just spirit. He was tangible. He was touchable. He was flesh and bone. Jesus said this in Luke 24, verse 38 and 39, after the resurrection. After the resurrection, he's standing there talking to the disciples. And he said this to them in verse 38. He says, why are you troubled and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bone as you see I have. Now, this is very important, and it's important because of the rise of false teaching that was coming up in John's day. And there was, at that time, when John's writing this, false teaching was, was quickly arising from a mixture of Greek and Christian, or Greek philosophy and Christianity known as Gnosticism. And, and, and the Gnostics, for the most part, I, I, I'm not going to get into all they believe this morning. We might talk about it some more next time. But, but the Gnostics, for the most part, believe that men, uh, uh, what they believe, many called it dualism. Many called it dualism, which, which is the, the belief that there's a separation between the spiritual and the physical. Meaning this, that everything spiritual is good, everything physical is not good, it's bad. Everything. 
from the things you can touch and see to every human being living on the face of the earth, is evil, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And everything spiritual is good. And, and so that's the way they looked at this. Now, because of this, this is the main problem that arises out of this. And understand, this comes from uh, Greek philosophy and a mix of Christianity. You know, when you begin to mix two different belief systems together, you, you got problems. You end up with an occult is what you end up with. And, and so because of this, they believe that Jesus did not have a physical body because they, they believed in Christ. They thought they was right with God. Amen. But they thought, well, he didn't have a physical body because physical bodies are evil. So Jesus didn't have a physical body. So do you see the problem that's going to arise from that? Because here's the thing. They believed that Jesus was more like a, like, a, like a pseudo phantom spirit, you know, because everything spiritual is good. Amen? And so this created the pro this problem because if the physical was truly all evil and Jesus was never a man because they didn't think Jesus ever had a physical body. And so if Jesus was never a man in the flesh then they denied the very foundations of faith and the source of salvation. If Jesus never had a body, if he was never born as a man, then they deny the fact of the virgin birth, a fulfillment of Scripture, a fulfillment of prophecy. If they deny that Jesus was ever physical, if he was ever in the flesh, if they deny that, then they deny Jesus' death on the cross. And they deny the resurrection. If you don't believe Jesus was born of a virgin, if you don't believe Jesus died on the cross for your sin, and you don't believe that he rose on the third day and is seated at the right hand of the Father, by, according, to Roman in, in, or according to Paul in Romans 10, or Ro Romans, I have, I have, I have one of them brain moments. I, I, I was going to make a political reference, but I'm not going to. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, according to Paul, if we don't believe that, then we're not saved. You know, I like what one preacher said. He said this. He, he said, he said to be wrong about, you cannot be wrong about Jesus and right with God. The Gnostics believed that they were right with God, even though they're wrong about Jesus. And, and John is setting this straight. You cannot be wrong about Jesus and right with God because Jesus is the only way to the Father. Amen? You have to believe in the virgin birth. You have to believe that he died on the cross. And you have to believe that he rose from the grave. Amen? John speaks in this letter as, as, as he's an eyewitness. He's the last remaining disciple. Remember, he's probably in his 80s at the time. And, and, and so as he writes this, he is the last one left. You know what's happened to the rest of them? They've been executed for their faith. They've all died because of what they believed. And John is saying, listen. He's saying, listen, I heard him speak. I heard him speak. I saw him face to face. I saw him face to face. I spent three and a half years with him in ministry every day. I touched him. He was real. That's what he's saying. He's testifying to what he knows about his relationship with Christ. He's saying, I can testify to the fact that the things you're being told by these false teachers are a lie. I can testify to that is what he's saying. And next in his introduction, John tells us who Jesus really is. And he drops a name. He drops a name. I don't know if you noticed this or not. When he says the words, word of life. He said, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. He just gave Jesus a name. And he'd done this for a, for a specific reason. Amen. Because he, he said this because it would get the attention of his Greek audience. When he said the word, word of life. You know, we need to learn how to present the gospel in a way that speaks to the people we're talking to. Amen? We need to make it real. and we need Not that it's not real, but to many people that are lost, it's not real to them. And we need to bring it down to their level. You know, when, like Paul said, when I'm in Rome, I'm like the Romans. 
In other words, he's going to preach the gospel in a way that the Romans would understand it. When, when he, you know, he's going to preach the sa- a different way to the Greeks. He's going to preach a different way to whatever people group because he's going to bring it to their level. Jesus taught in a way that brought it to the level of the people. He used parables about agriculture and different things of life to make the gospel real. And we have to learn when we're sharing the gospel with people, let's don't go over their head. Amen? Let's don't start quoting from Revelation and, and other things and saying, well, the, uh, God prophesied this and prophesied that. Well, we might be able to get to that, but let's begin to tell them about the love of God and what Jesus did for them. The fact that we are sinners, every one of us, and we need a Savior. How God set things in order. Amen? We need to keep it simple. Amen? And we need to keep it real. And John begins to say things here that seems a little deep to us, but in reality, he is speaking to a culture in the words they understand. So he uses the words word of life. Now, the Greek word there for word is logos. Many of you have heard this before if you've been in church any length of time. Logos. Now, what's significant is to the Greeks, because to the Greeks, the word logos meant ultimate reason. Ultimate reason. So you see the connection, what John's doing here. Ultimate reason. Uh, They believe that it was ultimate reason that controlled all things. To them, logos put sense into the world and made the world orderly. It was the controlling principle in the universe. So when John says, when he says, we proclaim concerning, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. Jesus is the word of life. So essentially, what John is saying to the Greeks is this. This logos you're you're always talking about that you may think is one thing. The reality is that Jesus is the logos. He is the word. He has been that from the beginning and always will be. He is eternal. He is real. He is approachable. And I know him. That's what John's saying. To his audience. That's what he's saying to you and I. Jesus is real, and I know him. That's what he's proclaiming. You know, when we share a testimony about Christ, we aren't sharing the gospel, but we're presenting something to get people to the gospel. Does that make sense? We're presenting to them what Jesus has done in us so that we can get them to what Jesus has done for them. John is saying to the, to the Greeks, to the philosophers, that he is not a thought or a philosophy, but he is alive, and he appeared to many. You know, as I said before, John's one of the last remaining disciples at the time, if not the last remaining disciple. All of those that have went before, these people have heard about. Nobody dies for a lie purposefully. These disciples that, that went to whatever the execution was, being run through with a sword, being decapitated, crucified upside down, burned alive, whatever it was, because there was all different ways that they was executed. They was all executed for their faith because they testified to the fact that Jesus died on the cross, he was buried for three days, and he rose to life again and ascended to heaven. If that was made up, they would not have took it that far. Nobody is going to face getting your head chopped off or being set on fire alive for a lie. Amen? Nobody's going to do that. And John's saying, listen, I know him. Everybody before me has been executed for it, and I'm sure I'm next. I know him. He is real. Amen? He is real. Uh, uh, This man, this life, uh, this word of life, John's talking about Jesus, we know. It, it, this, this life, he, he says, this life appeared. Look at what it says here. It says in verse 2, the life appeared, and we have seen it, we testify to it, and we proclaim it to you, the eternal life. So this life that he is speaking of here, uh, in, in verse, uh, let's look in verse 3. He says, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son and with His Son, Jesus Christ. So, this life that Paul's trying to explain to those that are hearing this false teaching came for a purpose. And that purpose is fellowship. 
Amen? Number one, salvation. But, but understand, salvation gets us to the fellowship. So he came for fellowship, the purpose of fellowship. John, again here, and that's why I'm sharing this, he uses a word that his audience would understand. A word that is very familiar, especially to the Greek audience. And when he uses the word fellowship, you know, we have a fellowship hall. We, we fellowship one with another. We know that as though we're spending some time together, we're talking and hanging out, you know, things like that. But he uses a Greek word, and it's koinonia. Koinonia. Now, the meaning of this word means a close partnership, a close partnership or a mutual participation. Now, that makes it a whole different level to me. A, a close partnership or mutual uh, participation. This word would have been used among the Greek culture to describe a business deal. Not a business deal, but a business partnership. Like if I had an uh, electrical business and Brother Mike's got an electrical business and we decide to bring them together and make a partnership, then that, that we, we've ha we have some common interest. Amen? We have some things in common we're invested in. Amen? We have a partnership. And we're participating in something together. You do not want me as a partner in electric work. It would be shocking. You just got that, didn't you, Emma? <laughs> but I'll give you kudos to you, Brother Mike. That was pretty good. He said it. I just repeated it. But it would have been used to describe a partnership or, 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 or a business venture you do together because you're sharing a common interest. Amen. Uh, John paints the picture in this that, that Jesus is the creator of all things and all life. Jesus was before the beginning. Jesus is real and he became like one of us. Amen. He makes himself known to us. Amen. He makes himself known to us. He came to restore what God longs for with his creation, which is fellowship. To have fellowship, to have a common partnership or a participation together with Christ. Amen. A relationship. You see why we started talking about relationship? Because that's what John is presenting in these first four verses is that you and I can have a relationship with Jesus. Amen. Are you glad you can have a relationship with Jesus? You don't sound like it. Amen. There you go. That's more like it. Be because what Jesus did and who he is, we can have that relationship with God that he designed from the beginning. But much better. Much better now. Amen. Let me explain. We can walk with God in our walk with Christ just like Adam did. Adam walked with God in the cool of the evening in the garden. God spoke with him. They fellowshiped. But it was taken away because of sin. Adam and Eve fell into sin. So paradise that they had was paradise lost. That fellowship with God was taken away. There was a division because of sin. Jesus came. He died on the cross. And he rose from the grave. Therefore bridging the gap between mankind and God to where now we can have that fellowship again. But he took it so much farther. Because our fellowship with God now is better than it was in the garden. Because we can't, we're, it's not only we can walk with God. Not only can we talk with God. But he lives in us through his spirit. Because of Jesus Christ. You see how much better it is now? We've got it better than Adam. We've got it better than Adam. We, we might have to experience sin and go through all the hardships of life. But I would rather have that and have him in me than to just have him near me. I love my relationship with Christ. I hope you love it the same way. Amen? Because it's what gives us strength. Amen? We have the Spirit of God as a gift to dwell in us. We have a partnership with him through his spirit. Amen. We, we can have real fellowship with him. As we have with one another. But even better. But even better. John closed this introduction. With the purpose for his letters. I showed you one of the first purposes of this letter. Was in verse 4. Write this, we write this in verse 4. To make our joy complete. To make our joy complete. I want to talk to you just for a moment. As they're beginning to play about this joy that he wants us to have complete. You see, it's possible to be a Christian 
and confess Christ and simply go through the motions without real joy. It's possible. It's possible to make that confession of faith, to believe in Christ, but walk without that joy in your life. And John's saying you don't have to do that. I want you to understand who he is, what he's done, so that you may have this joy in relationship with him. You see, sometimes we treat Jesus the way we treat a friend or the way we treat some, some people, their spouse. You see them for a little bit. You spend time with them for a little bit on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night or a Friday morning, whatever it may be. But you may not think about them the rest of the week. Oh, you may think about them, but I don't have time to spend with them. I'm busy. You see, when we go from knowing Christ to a fellowship with Christ, it's because we have a partnership, a participation. We fellowship with Him. We spend time with Him. And you know what happens when we begin to do that? We begin to have a joy that we can't even begin to understand. We begin to have a joy that's unspeakable, a joy that's full of glory. It doesn't make sense. It's a joy that comes when it shouldn't. You know, sometimes we go through things in life that are hard, that are difficult, and they're painful, and they're lonely, and things like that. And we don't know how in the world to find joy in those times. But He is that joy that comes at those times. He is that joy that could be always with us. I'm brought in my mind, I'm brought back to Paul. As he was imprisoned, in chains. And it's not like going to the Bullitt County Detention Center. I mean, this is probably nasty and filthy and rats and everything else and dark. He's probably bloody from being beaten and everything else and bugs trying to eat in his, in his wounds and different things. And yet he sings praises to God. He is having he, that joy that comes to him in a place to where he, 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 it doesn't, doesn't make sense. That's the joy that we don't understand. That's the joy that can only come from God because we have fellowship with Him. Stephen, one of the great apostles, one of the, he was the first martyr of the church that we know of. And, and as he, people are gathered around him, all the religious leaders, even the soon-to-be apostle Paul that we know as Saul at the time, stands there as he instructs people to pick up stones and kill this man simply because of his belief. And Stephen, as these stones are being chugged at him, as he's being hit in the head and in the back and everywhere else, and these are probably not little bitty stones. These are stones like what's out there on the other side of the carport. These are stones that would crush your skull and break your bones. And as they stone him, he stands up, he looks to heaven and raises his hands, and he says he can see the Father. Or Jesus standing next to the Father. And he's like, Lord, forgive him. Because he found joy at a time that most people wouldn't. Because the joy that we find in fellowship with Jesus doesn't come because of our circumstances. It doesn't come because of our enjoyment in whatever we're doing. It comes because of who we know. It comes because of a relationship that we have. Those of you who are happily married, you understand what I'm talking about. You experience a joy that, that, that we, we can't, it's hard to explain because we enjoy one another. Therefore, we spend time with one another. We love one another. God wants that fellowship with you. He wants that relationship with you, that intimacy with you. And John is explaining in his epistle, it's achievable. It's possible. You can have it. God's not way over here. We don't have the separation between good spirit and evil physical, as the Gnostics thought. We have the spirit inside our fleshly body because he wants to have a partnership. He wants, to have a, he wants us to have participation with him. You can have that relationship. Amen? You can have that fellowship with him, and that's what he desires for you. Hallelujah. Father, Lord, we just come to you today. We thank you for your word.
We thank you for the free gift of salvation. We thank you, Lord, for for the gift of of the Holy Spirit to dwell inside of us. And God, I pray, Lord, that you just speak to every heart that's here today. Everyone that's listening online. Everyone that watches this this service, Lord God. I pray, God, that you you just pierce their hearts, Lord God. Pierce our hearts, Lord God. Help us to understand who you are. Help us to understand our identity in you. Lord God, that we can have fellowship with you. More than just fellowship, we can have koinonia. We can have a partnership. We can have a a, a participation in you, Lord God, because you put your spirit in us. We have a relationship deeper than a husband and wife. We have a relationship deeper than, than a parent and a child. Lord God, we have a relationship that is only possible through you. Lord, help us to grow stronger in that. Help us to grow stronger, to grow stronger in our walk with you. Lord, I thank you that we can have a relationship with you. I thank you, Lord God, that you want to fellowship with us and spend time with us. God, I pray that you help us to begin to make time, that we begin to seek you. That we begin to make a point in our lives to have that fellowship with you, Lord. And I pray that you give us joy. I pray that you give us joy that's unspeakable. Lord God, joy that we don't understand, joy that comes at times when we shouldn't have it. Lord, I pray that you fill us with your joy, Lord God, because ours isn't enough. I pray that you fill us with your joy because happiness doesn't cut it. Lord, I pray that you fill us with your joy because what we find in others isn't good enough. Lord, because what we find in, in the things that we do and hobbies and other things is not good enough. It's not gonna, it's not gonna suit us, Lord God. It doesn't satisfy the hunger we have. Lord God, and I pray that you fill it with your joy. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. If you need special prayer, I want to pray with you this morning as they lead in song. If you're sick in your body and you want to believe God for healing, I want to pray with you. If you got something you're struggling with and you want God to help you with it, I'm going to believe with you. Amen. Hallelujah. If you want to stand in for someone you know, I want to pray with you. Hallelujah. For a few moments as they lead in song, the altar's open. Hallelujah.
Praise the Lord. Let's stand as we close in a word of prayer this morning. Hey, God's moving. Amen? God's moving. You know, when, when people come to the altar and they, and they, they believe God is, is going to answer a prayer, God's moving. When people come to the altar because they want that joy, God's moving. When people come to the altar because they believe God can fix situations in someone that's not even here, God is moving. Amen? The Spirit of God is present in this place. Hallelujah, and he's present in you. You're saved today. Hallelujah. Brother Rob, would you close us in a word of prayer? Mm-hmm. Okay. Amen. Well, just reach out your hand towards Rob right now. Lord, we pray for Rob and for Dale. Lord God, they're fighting through all of this red tape, Lord God. And, and Father, I pray, Lord, that you give them favor. I pray that you begin to work these things out, Lord God, as people come across the border without any paperwork and they try to do things right, Lord God, and they're hitting obstacles. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that you give them favor. Lord, I pray that you go before them and before this paperwork and you begin to put it on the right desk in front of the right person that's going to move it along and get these things done, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Five days doesn't mean nothing to you, Lord. Five days doesn't mean nothing. Lord, one day is as a thousand years in your presence. And Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that you just make a way where there seems to be no way. Lord, you make it happen. And we thank you for it, Lord God, in your precious name. Hallelujah. And everybody said? Amen. 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 Would you close us in a word of prayer?